All right, well, good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Yes, amen. So we have a lot to rejoice in. The sun's shining. It's a beautiful day out. We got a much-needed rain the last few days that uh, we definitely need. And I see the corn is really greened up. It's kind of shot up. And so I know all the farmers are happy, and it seems like there's more water in the river. So those of us who like to maybe kayak or fish, we're happy about that as well. So we have a lot to celebrate today. And guess what? God's here with us as well. God's joined us with us here this morning. So let's stand as we sing our gathering hymn. Wonderful words of life. Let's sing it to you. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful Christ, the blessed one, gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so free. Terry for playing, and thank you, uh, Carter, for the tech. Um, this Tuesday, not this Thursday, we're having our council meeting at 9.30 at the church here. So it's this Tuesday at 9.30. And uh, July 30th, the last Sunday of the month, um, Mary Ann will be here, so she wants the choir to sing. So it'll be 9.45 practice. Anybody else? Hey, I want to thank everybody who helped in any way do the baked potato meal last Sunday. We had a wonderful crowd. We sold out. It was more than we expected. The food was good. And for those who worked and those who made desserts and salads, we can't do this kind of thing without all of you. So thank you. And when we call on you again, I hope you will be just as receptive. <laughs> We took in over $900, but that was before we paid for the, the food and so on. And Leanne isn't here, so I'm not sure how much we ended up with. We do have enough to send Carter and 
and Pastor Rob on the mission trip. And then anything that's left over. Oh, Margie, you know how much we made? <laughs> we took in $1,159.01. Wow. <laughs> and do we have our bill? Do we know how much our profit was? No. Okay, we don't know that yet. But uh, well, anyway. That's in God's hands, right? Yes. <laughs> but um, plenty of money to do what we started out to do, and the rest will go into the mission uh, fund for whatever Leanne is doing, her, her kits and, and different types of things. So thank you again. Anyone else? Is that Pastor Rob? All right. So um, as Sandy mentioned, the. Uh, raise enough money for a car night to go on our trip so we're going to leave next sunday but we'll have service here but i might have an abridged service because we need to get down to the des moines airport and get on a plane by four so to make sure car and i have enough leeway i want to make sure we're done at 11 30 so so we'll have service next sunday i'll be here and car will be here but we'll have maybe sort of a bridge service just so we have a little leeway because <laughs> you know tsa you never, you never know there. So I want to make sure we got enough time. And then plus we're meeting uh, someone who I, I never met that bought all the tickets for our whole group. So there's some other things out in there. So thank you everyone for, for uh, the support with that. And then the following Sunday, uh, we'll be heading back home, but not till the evening. So uh, Pastor Bruce Whittern is going to be filling in for me on, on the 30th when, when Mary Ann's here. So. And then, so then when we actually do come back on, I believe it's, the following Sunday is the 5th or 6th of August. Uh, what I plan to do is all the photos I take, I'll, I'll do a presentation at Fellowship, kind of like what Hannah did when she went to Tanzania. So so I'll, I'll do a presentation then of, of our trip and, and tell you all about all the stuff that we did. So make plans to join us for that. All right, well, let's stand as we sing our hymn of praise this morning. Thy word is a lamp. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. from busy summertime days to this place of worship. We come to connect with God's word. We come in from the stress of everyday life into the light of knowledge. We come as the of truth. And come into worship with offerings of praise. We come to hear the word and respond. Well, loving God, gather us into this moment of reverence, celebration, and growth. As your sons and daughters, we long for renewed faith and meaning in our lives. Christ's parable of the sower lights our path. With its images of rocky ground, tangled thorns, and green shoes. So may the light of your word illuminate our way and become the joy of our hearts. Amen. And our Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment or two and greet one another this morning. Thank you. 
business with you. All right, well, since we... Uh, we have some young ones here this morning. I have some for a kid's message. You can come forward if you like. All right, so two weeks ago, you can have a seat if you like. Two weeks ago, uh, my family and I went on vacation and we went to um, Lake Itasca and Lake Bemidji. And Lake Bemidji has a uh, legend about it of Paul Bunyan and, and Babe. So they have big statues here. So you can see there's Paul Bunyan and, and Babe the Blue Ox and then there's my wife Melinda and I in front of that. Those are big statues, aren't they? Yeah. Now, have, had you heard of Paul Bunyan before? No? Okay, I'll tell you about Paul Bunyan. So you can, you can look at that if you like. Whoops. There we go. So um, Paul Bunyan is you can see he's a lumberjack, and supposedly he, he was this really larger-than-life guy, and he helped clear a bunch of logs and kind of build, build up that area. And so Lake Bemidji was supposedly formed by his footprint. So it kind of looks like his foot, and then there's a smaller lake that would be like his heel. And then the Mississippi River, the big Mississippi River starts. It flows out of Lake Bemidji and starts to head south. So apparently his axe then... He carved the whole Mississippi River with, with his axe. So there's this big legend of, of Paul Bunyan. And in the um, visitor center, there's different relics. So there's like uh, his pipe that he smoked. So it's like this large pipe and all these funny larger-than-life things that were supposedly belonged to, to Paul Bunyan. But that's a tall tale that, that people tell, tell and kind of share, and that's linked with uh, Bemidji. Well, people want to say the same thing about the Bible. They say, well, that's a great story, but that's kind of, what's that? You're three? Wow. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I was three once. Yeah, once. <laughs> we, all, we all were three once. <laughs> yeah. But they want to say that about the Bible, like stories like Noah's Ark. Like, well, that's a good story, but really, two of every animal, I mean, come on, that's, that's a pretty tall tale. Or like David and Goliath, when David knocked down this giant with just a rock, and like, well, that's a pretty tall tale there, but... But actually, we believe the Bible to be true. We believe the Bible to be God's word. And yeah, there's a lot of things in there that are hard to believe, right? There's a lot of things that, that do seem like really tall tales, but yet that's God's word to us. And the reason the impossible becomes possible is because God did it. God's the one that, that did that and not just people. And so remember that when we read that. If it seems too good to be true, it would be if it was up to us, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. Amen? All right.
three of us and our dog all crossed the Mississippi there at Lake Itasca. Yep. <laughs> so join me, if you will, in our offertory response and, and prayer. Something beautiful, something good. Oh, how about that one? I got it on the wrong page. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Just as your word is a light to our path, Holy One, may our offering of praise be a light to the world. In this season of fruitful gardens, help us share bountiful harvests of our own making, whether our offering be our time, wealth, or prayer. Receive and multiply our gifts through the glory of your love. Amen. You may be seated. scripture reading today is from Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112. Your word is a lamp before my feet and a light for my journey. And I have sworn, and fully mean it, I will keep your righteous rules. I have been suffering so much, Lord. Make me live again according to your promise. Please, Lord, Accept my spontaneous gifts of praise. Teach me your rules. Though my life is constantly in danger, I won't forget your instruction. Though the wicked have set a trap for me, I won't stray from your precepts. Your laws are my possession forever because they are my heart's joy. I have decided to keep your statutes for every every last one of them. And the sermon text is Romans 8, verses 1 through 11. So now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. God has done what was impossible for the law since it was weak because of selfishness. God condemned sin in the body by sending his own son to deal with sin in the same body as humans who are controlled by sin. He did this so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now the way we live is based on the spirit, not based on selfishness. People whose lives are based on selfishness think about selfish things. But people whose lives are based on the Spirit think about things that are related to the Spirit. The attitude that comes from selfishness leads to death. But the attitude that comes from the Spirit lives to a life and peace. So the attitude that comes from selfishness is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law because it can't. People who are self-centered aren't able to please God. But you aren't self-centered. Instead, you are in the spirit. If in fact, God's spirit lives in you. If anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to him. 
If Christ is in you, the spirit is your life because of God's righteousness. But the body is dead because of sin. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your human bodies also through the spirit that lives in you. That's the readings for today. So that one phrase in there that Joanne read, the righteous requirement fulfilled is what really kind of leaped out to me during um, the reading of Romans chapter 8 here, verses 1 through 11. And so I found this image of this bucket like being filled up, and it kind of makes me think of that. It's not just fill. I mean, you see the water is brimming over and, and overflowing. So to start out this morning, I want to ask, how many of you are familiar with the Sammy Hagar song, I Can't Drive 55? Yeah, yeah. several of us. Few of us who enjoy good music know that song, right? <laughs> well, anyways, basically it was written as like a protest to when the time when there was the national highway speed limit was 55. So all the highways in the U.S. It was 55, and the song is basically saying, "I can't drive 55. It takes me six hours just to get to L.A." That's that's part of the, of the the song, and so. Since these laws have, have been reversed and kind of each state sort of mandates what the highway speed limit is. But when it came to this, you're left with a certain quandary. So do I follow the law and go 55 or do I break it? <laughs> so I've shared with you before that I did my undergrad in Southern California. And I remember the first time I drove on the freeway there, I, I was scared to death. I mean, not only was it two lanes, it was usually four lanes, and then there were places where another freeway or two joined together, and there would be like eight lanes. And let me tell you, people did not drive 55. So I felt like the first time I got on there, once I got on the acceleration ramp, I mean, it was pedaled to the metal, and I better be going 70 by the time I go, go to merge, or I'm not getting on. I mean, it was just like shaking, scared. After a while, you get used to it, and you realize everybody drives like an idiot, and you just kind of become an idiot with them, and, and it seems okay. But to actually drive the speed limit there was risky because nobody went the speed limit. Unless it was stop and go traffic, then, of course, they went a lot less. But if you're, if you're going to drive 55, you risk people cutting you off all the time and giving you the California howdy, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It was really almost impossible to try to merge over and change lanes if, if you needed to. And so, needless to say, I pretty much ignored what the speed limit was. And really the risk of being pulled over was not there because everybody else was going at least 15 miles an hour faster than I was. But for us today, do you drive the speed limit on the roads in Iowa? No, I'm not asking for an answer. I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. But it kind of made me think of, remember the WWJD question mark? Remember that whole thing, what would Jesus do? And I thought, yeah, if Jesus had a truck like mine and he was driving the highways around here, what would Jesus do? Would he go 55 or, or 60, whatever it is? Or would he go 65, 67, maybe a little faster? I, don't know. I think Jesus would actually go to the speed limit. And so I'm not trying to pass judgment, but it does seem contradictory to follow the laws that we agree with and kind of ignore the ones that we don't necessarily like. Seems contradictory, doesn't it? And it brings up this interesting ethical question. What if it's actually justified to break the law? Then it, does it become okay? So here's an example. Let's say your wife is in labor. And you got to get her to the hospital now. Is that okay to speed then? She would say yes. <laughs> Most definitely, right? Or, well, I only stole that because I was hungry and I didn't have any money for it, to pay for it. Okay, is that all right then? Well, I didn't report that on my income, on my taxes, because... Well, it bumped me up into the other tax bracket, and that's really unfair. And so I'll just give this amount. 
I'll give a lot of that to charity. I'll do that to help others and do the most good. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention that or, or put that on my income tax. Okay. I'm going to buy this one lottery ticket, God. And if I win, I'm definitely giving 10% to the church, right? That'd be a lot of money. So it's okay, right? I'm going to give, I'm going to give a good portion of, of this, my winnings to the church. So, so that, that would be okay. Cause the church wins and I win, right? See, it's easy to justify our actions and behaviors, especially if you feel you're being treated unjustly. Like somehow that's, that's unfair to me. And so this is the mindset behind these laws, I think, that they keep wanting to put into practice, that we need to be soft on crime. Why? Well, it's not that person's fault. It's the system's fault. Because the system's racist. The system's oppressive. The system's unjust. That's, that's why they did what they did. And so we're going to treat them with, with kindness and respect. We're going we're to be soft on, on this crime because it's not the person's fault. It's the system's fault. So if we, if we give them a light sentence and we let them out, then they're going to be grateful, right? They're going to be grateful and they're not going to commit those crimes again. Hmm. Well, if you've been looking at what's happening in Seattle, let's say, or Portland, or San Francisco, or Chicago... How's that working out for them? <laughs> How, how's that soft on crime working out? It, does it have the, is it coming to fulfillment what they think would happen? So we take another way of looking at anthropology. Anthropology, or we could say the human condition. Why humans behave, how they do, the reasoning behind that. Why is the reason that people break the law? Well, it's because the reason they make bad decisions is a lack of education. They just don't know any better. They don't know the difference. Nothing's been modeled to them. They're a product of their environment. And so if they were just taught moral and ethics, then they would make the right path. They would choose the right path and make the right decision. So it no longer becomes a sin issue. It becomes an education issue. People are a product of their surroundings. Now, I do agree with most of that because I do believe people are part of their environment. They only know what they've grown up experiencing. Education to show that there's another way to live. Life skills that can be taught that can say, hey, this can improve your way of life. This can improve your income. This can improve your financial situation, your general well-being. I mean, all these things are important and good. But when it takes away the, the sin issue, then it becomes the idea that we can actually save ourselves. We don't need Jesus. You know, think, think of children. Children only know what's being modeled to them by their parents or other adults, caregivers, whatever it might be. That's the only thing that they know. So we take the sin equation out of that, that we believe that we can actually save ourselves. We don't even need Jesus. But if you go back to what I talked about last week, we know that this is not possible. This is when Paul says, you know, I do the things I don't want to do. And the things I want to do, I'm, able to, I'm unable to do it. Why? Because of sin. But thankfully, we are no longer slaves to sin. Amen? You had one of those things. You could, this is a good time to wave that right now. <laughs> Amen. See, we have Christ in us, and that meets that righteous requirement. Now, on our own, can we ever reach that requirement? No. Hence, we look at this illustration of the bucket. And not only is it to the brim, but it's flowing over. Now, if it was up to me to fill that bucket... Maybe half, ah, that's, that's a stretch, I think. I don't know, I think I'd even get there half. But it's not on me or us. It's because Christ is alive in us. Guess what? My bucket is full and overflowing. Amen? My bucket and our bucket is filled to the brim and overflowing. If Christ is in us, then we live as people of the Spirit. If Christ isn't in us, as it says in Romans 8, then we become self-centered. Instead of having our focus be on God and of others, which is 
what it's supposed to be. That's the greatest commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbors as yourself. So it should be on God and on others. Instead, it becomes inward focus. We take our eyes off of God, our eyes off of the other, and becomes inward focus. Now, do you think that is true of society today? That people are very much inward focused? Yeah. So, if we were to go out to eat, let's say, and we sit at the table, look around at everyone else in the restaurant, at all the other tables, look around, and I can say with almost 100% certainty, every other table is going to look like this. Yeah. Right? Everybody's looking at their phone. There could be four or five people at the table. Are they talking to each other? Communicating? Are they paying attention? No, no, they're on, looking at their phone. and Yeah. We become very much self-centered, inward focused. So here's another thing that burns me when I see this. It's when <clears throat> a mom or dad, both, they have a young child, and they're out in the store or wherever it is. And the child kind of starts acting up. They're like, oh, here, watch this. And they give him a tablet with some video thing on it to make them be quiet. Instead of actually interacting with the child and be like, oh, what do you need? Are you okay? Or what? Oh, here, watch this. I need some time to myself so I can think. Right? It's, it's, more, it's not about the child. It's about me. I need, I need some time to focus. Leave me alone. Let me be quiet. Instead of interacting with them, no, leave me alone. Here, watch this. See, inward focus, again, goes against that greatest commandment. When our eyes are turned away from God then we get this crazy thinking that starts to take place. We've seen this happening, this, this crazy thinking. And just when I thought, you know, things couldn't get worse, like the insane train has probably reached the station. No, 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 it keeps going, you know, like the idea of mutilating our children, performing surgical mutilations on our children when their brains haven't even developed enough to know who they even are, even what they want. They can't even think critical of thinking because their brain hasn't even developed that yet, but yet we're willing to make decisions for them that totally, totally change their life. Or here's the, the newest one. This, this, I heard about this this last week. The CDC says it's okay to promote chest feeding you're like, chest feeding? What is that, Pastor Rob? Well, it's the idea that someone who didn't give birth can actually chest feed an infant. So they said, we should promote this. And the drugs that and the hormones a person takes and injects into their body to make that happen have some major, major side effects. And so you take those things, you produce milk, and you give that to the infant guess what? That gets passed on to the infant. I mean, that's why they tell mothers, be careful on how much coffee you drink, right? Because it goes to the infant. I mean, it's common, common sense. See, this type of insanity happens when you're inward focused. Because it's no longer about the child. It's about, well, I want to be able to do that. I should be able to do that. And it goes against God's wonderful design that those first week when the mother's milk comes in, it has that real thick colostrum, those ingredients that, one, it helps the baby get off to a great start, grow big and strong, and it's wonderful for fighting against disease and infection. And you know what? It's not just humans, human mothers. Animals have that exact same thing. God designed it that way. And we're basically saying, eh, who cares? Again, ignoring God, focus becoming inward. Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, there is a better way. And that's where we as a church can come in on this. Why? Because we have Christ living inside of us. And we can model something better. We can model that, you know what, there is a better way to live than to think to think that way, to act that way. So listen to verse 11 again. 
So if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead would give life to your human bodies also through his spirit that lives in you. See, it's very important that Jesus came as a human. It's very important to know that when Jesus died on the cross and took on the sin of the world, he did that in his humanity because he took our sins as well. He did that for us. It was also in his humanity when God raised him from the dead. We had that promise of a new resurrected body because it wasn't just Jesus' spirit. No, it was his body. And so when Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave, it's that same Jesus who lives in us. It's that same Jesus that sets our bodies free from slavery to sin and death. And it's that same Jesus who's able to give life to our bodies. Why? Because it's that spirit that is alive in us. Amen. It's that spirit that is alive in us. And last week I shared, and if you got nothing else out of what I said last week, this is the, the main crux I want you to know. Don't feel guilty or somehow less than a Christian because we mess up now and again. <laughs> Join the club, right? <laughs> Join the club. We, we don't need to feel guilty or somehow less than or not worthy of God's love or any of that garbage that people want to tell us or feel. That is definitely not true. Again, those first two verses in what Joanne read, Romans 8 because there is no longer any condemnation for those who Christ is alive in them for those who know Jesus there is no longer any condemnation why because that righteous requirement has been fulfilled so is Jesus alive yes yes yeah amen right did God raise him from the dead yes yes is that same Jesus living in you? Yes. All right. Then how can there be any condemnation in us then? Right? If those three things are correct, then how can there be any condemnation inside of us? It's only because we put it on ourselves. Don't do that. Don't do that. Remember, you are made in the image of God. You know what we are? We are light bearers. We reflect Jesus to the world. We reflect the light and love of Jesus. Why? Because we're made in God's image and we reflect that back. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. So that spirit is alive in you. And so no matter what tries to you know, pull or twist or tear or somehow change that for you, confuse our thinking, we need to remember who we are and whose we are. Amen? Let's pray. God, I just ask for clarity for all of us here. Lord, your spirit is alive in each and every one of us. Help us live in that reality and what that truly means. That we are a son or a daughter of you. Let your light shine bright through each and every one of us. And Lord, as we continue to keep our focus on you, and on others around us. Let those be our focus and our priorities. And Lord, we offer up all these things as we say the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, join me in our next hymn, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. Let us sing that together.
So may your path be gentle, your soil rich, and your weeds small. As you go forth into the world, look for gardens to water, feed, and cultivate. Nurture the love of Christ in others as well as in yourselves. Amen. Righteous and holy in all of your ways. We come before you with honor and praise, here to adore you for all of our days. We come before you with honor and praise. Lord of the heaven, how faithful thou art, shine down upon and holy in all of your ways. We come before you with honor and praise. Filling the temple, the work of your grace. We come before you with honor and praise. Here to <laughs> Here to adore you for all of our days. We come before you with honor and praise. Lord of the heavens, how faithful you are. Rise in our spirits, O bright morning star. Righteous and holy in all of your ways, we come before you with honor.